Hey guys, welcome back to Clockwork Dandy Needles. I have another breakdown for you guys. Welcome back to Requiem of the Rose King. This is episode five. We're approaching the halfway mark and the story is about to get a lot darker. We're starting to get a lot of key people into certain positions and events are starting to play out. I think I know where I am actually in the storyline now. Uh, in canon terms, obviously the story may not be following canon. I am still expecting there to be a massive twist where it turns canon completely on its head. Before we get going, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel. It does me a huge favor and I really do appreciate all the support that I can get. It allows YouTube just to know that the channel is doing okay and people are interested in the content that I am putting out. There's a Discord channel too that will allow you to have a notification sent straight to your phone whenever videos go up on my channel. Let's talk about episode 5 because there's a lot of interesting things that are happening this episode and there's a lot of setup going on. There's a big setup to a certain event I think is coming our way. Back we left off with a bit of an internal struggle, a big announcement that shocked Warwick, all of the people of the England, that we have a queen and the queen was from a lower standing than a king would normally be expected to marry into. So we've got an internal struggle and this is probably the worst time to have an internal struggle because we also know that up north we've got Edward. He has captured his father. His father's now being released to the other side. Opposition brewing up in Scotland. When they need to be strong, this is the worst time to actually have the cracks internally showing. This week we get the truth coming out on Elizabeth. I think somebody said they couldn't quite place where Elizabeth's name had come from or who Elizabeth was. Despite that, Elizabeth is bad news. Well, she's an opportunist. She's an opportunist and everything is going to her plan. She planned absolutely everything. Kind of figured that she had already said that she only loved her husband and her husband had died and she wasn't going to love another man. Just because you're marrying someone doesn't necessarily mean you have to love them, especially during this period. She plans to bring her own family into positions of high power. She is bringing more of her family into the court. But of course, we saw poor Warwick being humiliated. And the one thing you probably shouldn't do is backstab your own friends. Warwick's betrayal is something that was on the cards anyway. You couldn't really expect him to lie down and take the humility very kindly. We do see some slight strife amongst Edward's own family. George wasn't very happy with the announcement. Richard initially says they don't like Elizabeth, but Richard tries to stay more neutral, takes a neutral stance. Of course, Richard was already aware of the marriage, so that puts Richard in a bit of a very awkward position anyway. Doesn't really have much of a leg to stand on. But it did seem a little bit pop kettle black initially as we meet the Duke of Buckingham shaming the king for his marriage. Despite the fact that we just found out that the Duke of Buckingham had actually married into Elizabeth's family. Although he, as we find out, it's a forced marriage. We can presume Elizabeth has manipulated Edward's hand and forced Duke of Buckingham to marry into her family. Putting her family into a dukedom position as well, which generally wouldn't even be available to her, let alone the role of queen as well. There is a lot of strategic marriages going on during this period of time as well. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, you know all about the marriages of convenience, marrying for strength because you know that a certain family is going to strengthen your position, your claim. A war with France is constantly a threat during this period of time. England was in the middle of turmoil. It was fighting amongst itself. France is trying to take the throne. We've got Louis on the throne. I can't remember exactly what Louis was. There generally always is a Louis on the throne for France. You can guarantee that France isn't exactly going to take betrayal or the sudden cutting off friendship between the two very lightly. So we can see them trying to reach out to Warwick, sowing those seeds to get Warwick to actually backstab. Edward's biggest downfall was backstabbing Warwick. If Warwick had somehow been included or they had at least gone to Warwick and explained or something, I don't think it would have been as bad. But turning your own allies against you, especially when you came to power... Not because you had a claim to the throne, but you've come to power and you've declared yourself a king. It's a very weak position to be in. If we marry the sister of the king of France, you've got a claim to throne. You've got that royal blood there. With women at this period of time not holding too much power other than being gambits, you'd have that inheritance there and your child would definitely be an heir to the throne. We do see the seeds being set in Richard's head as the Duke of Buckingham tries to place the idea that you could be the king. 
Note that this entire sentence is treason. Anything like this is conspiring against your royalty, your king. It's not unheard of for royalty to bump off other royalty. A lot of fights during history have occurred during sibling rivalries, or especially if you look at Rome. Rome had a few heirs, potential heirs to the role of emperor. A lot of bumping off happened. We know this is going to get bloody. The vision of the Black Wings and we see Daddy Richard making an appearance. Black Wings are an ill omen, however, they are still wings, they are still the ability to fly, so they are still a sign of freedom, despite it perhaps being a dark, impure freedom. Telling Richard that your name, your name Richard, is the name of a king. And spur this notion that Richard could climb to the top. Henry's fate this week. Henry had been captured and has now been turned over to Edward. Presumably right now, Henry is occupying again the Tower of London. As I told you guys before, it's not a prison. It's more like house arrest because the conditions in the Tower of London are a lot better than the prisons of the time where you'd be thrown in and you'd probably die in a pit forgotten or eaten by rats. The conditions in real prison are awful compared to the conditions inside the Tower of London. Warwick takes both George and Richard up to his. Edward initially allows this because he wants to save face to pretend that, you know, I trust you, I trust you, you can have my brothers, it's fine. Understanding that he's definitely upset Warwick and he's trying to make a compromise by going, you can look after them, they can stay with you for a bit. By this point, Warwick has completely given up on Edward. He nearly understands that he's lost. He's going to try and find somebody else that he can manipulate and put on the throne. And a marriage to his, his daughters is going to do just that. It's also interesting to note that Edward kept Henry's capture a complete secret from Richard. It's a bit of an odd choice for Edward to keep this capture a secret. Let's talk about canon really quickly. As I've said before, Richard's real wife is Anne. And we've met Anne a few times now. And this is the Anne we're talking to in the castle. One of Warwick's daughters. Living with Warwick does allow us to get a glimpse at a canon relationship. And how perhaps these two bounced off one another. For Richard overhears a certain conversation. These two do get on. These two do get on naturally. And Anne really does like Richard. Anne actually has feelings for them. Joan of Arc pops up once again to torment, tease Richard to state that you're in love with Henry and trying to provoke Richard. Even though we've had the name Henry given, Henry is a very common name. And as you're seeing, even with me, because I'm struggling, because there's multiple names going on, there's two Richards, there's two Edwards, they're very common names. At this period of time, people would name their sons and their daughters after royalty because it was seen as a good thing to do. A lot of the names as well were named after religious icons. At this point, it was common to keep renaming your own kids after you so we see Richard naming Richard Richard we are given the fact that Richard had apparently at this point ignored Anne's letters however this week we do see fate starting to bring the two closer together but that could be wrecked by the end conversation overheard it's a nice little insight into the role of women at this period of time we also hear it before when Richard states that the role of the woman is to stay at home so and wait to be protected women are not allowed to step foot on the battlefield we have obviously seen margaret up north but margaret is a very unique case as i said history remembers her as a valiant fierce woman some of them believe that she was possessed by the spirit of a man if a woman is in power she's done something very clever to get herself into that position to stay in that position Warwick was banking on at least one of the two falling in love with one of his daughters. Thankfully, he's got two daughters. Both George and Richard have claims to the throne now. And Warwick is naturally aware of this. So he plans to make use of this and get one of the two on the throne. Married to one of his daughters, therefore, he still has a very strong link to the throne because he is naturally the father of the queen. Initially, he pegs George, George getting drunk and encouraged to drink. And we've got Isabel falling over purposefully to try and seduce him. Going a bit too hard on the seduction tactics there. Whilst we see a different tactic with Anne and Richard, Anne actually likes Richard. Richard relaxing, being around Anne, perhaps being more attracted to the carefree nature because Anne's not throwing herself all over Richard. Self-aware that she doesn't want to throw herself at somebody. Anne is definitely a lot more, less sus than Isabel in the way that she handles herself. And we do see that at the end, Anne is the one who actually opposes her father. The second sight of Joan of Arc is where we get the confirmation that I am you, which is a confirmation that Joan of Arc is more a manifestation of 
Richard's inner thoughts, the inner guilt, the inner worries, the inner luggage that Richard carries. As Richard ponders what gift to get Anne because Anne gets sick for being outside in the cold, we're even pointed out that at this point Richard was reading a romance novel. If things had continued the way they were, if Richard had not overheard the conversation, things would have probably actually gone okay for Richard. Obviously he would be living a bit of a life. Even if Richard had married Anne, we've also got Warwick breathing down Richard's neck. Once realising that George probably isn't a safe bet, all eyes turn to Richard. Warwick starts to pressurise Anne, which is where we're going to get the sad conversation. It's actually quite sad to note that if Warwick hadn't actually said anything to Anne, the end result that he was banking on would have probably happened naturally on its own because these two were definitely in that good position. Richard was already on the way to see Anne and Richard had even gotten her the gift of a snowman because, as Anne said, I really wanted to make a snowman before she twisted her ankle. But it is sad that Warwick sticking his oar in where it wasn't actually needed ends up making the things go horrifically wrong because Richard overhears the entire conversation. I don't believe Anne anymore. Here's Anne stating, I don't want to marry Richard, which again is a misunderstanding in a sense because you know that Richard thinks that means Anne doesn't like them like that and doesn't want to marry them, despite the fact that it, she does like Richard. She just doesn't want to marry on the grounds that her father is pushing for. Let's talk about the end sequence when we get Elizabeth's big plan revealed because she's talking to herself. Thank you, Elizabeth, for talking to yourself to announce to the audience your evil, evil plan. The plan was to kill Edward. She never really loved Edward. We already knew this. She planned to have her own child on the throne as king and to manipulate the king because there's a certain point when a king is too young and they'll have a retainer, they'll have somebody who acts instead of them. Elizabeth doesn't need Edward, oh dear, he fell down the stairs. Her child has the blood of the king and her in it. The one who has the best plight to the throne, the one who actually has a proper shot at the throne, isn't actually Elizabeth if Richard dies, it's her child. So this is what she's banking on. If I have Richard around long enough, I have my child, then let's say the child hits two, Edward dies by accident, oops, my, my bad, I will be um, acting regent whilst my child is growing up. That is the initially her plan. The end as well, we see Richard falling into madness, which I think is starting to set us up for a certain event that Richard is actually famed for you know the story of Richard III, you know the event coming up. I'm not going to spoil it in the case of people who aren't clued up on English history. I say 90% I know what's coming up. Another interesting episode, we're starting to gear up for the darker half of the anime. Well, it'll all depend on whether the anime is going to stick to canon or not and how much of Shakespeare it's drawing upon. This event definitely takes place in Shakespeare. I'm not going to say too much, actually. I feel like I'm going to spoil it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait for it to happen in the anime because I am certain it's going to happen. Thank you guys again for tuning in. I hope my video at least helps you make sense of what's going on. Shakespeare is complicated enough as it is, so I'm trying my best to break things down and simplify them, give you some reasons, nugget of history whenever it comes up. I will see you guys again next week. Make sure you're taking care of yourselves and having a good weekend. Bye-bye.